Good afternoon, welcome. My name's Adia. Uh, as you can see, I'm a speaker coach. Uh, when people hear that word, sometimes they think that I'm going to be all over them, like how many things they say, like what their accent is. Not that at all. It's actually just really practical ways to get up here and be in this position. So, my first question to you is when you see this, you're up here next to you, like you swapping places, standing here, how does that make you feel? Great. Great? Amazing. Okay, so maybe lots of you that you're like excited, yeah, I'm ready. Or you may have already spoken today, or you may be speaking tomorrow. Is there anyone here that looks at that and thinks, oh, not sure? A little bit nervous. Just trying to see where people are in the spectrum. No, so it looks like we've got quite a few experienced speakers. Who here speaks quite a lot? Okay, who here would like to speak more? Who here avoids speaking? Okay, then that's absolutely fine. There's always a mix. There's no right answer. What's really fantastic with public speaking is one of those brilliant skill sets, skill sets where there's literally always somewhere to start, no matter whether you're in fear and avoiding or whether you're super experienced, and there's always a way to improve. So this workshop is going to be looking at some of the fundamentals, which some people can think of as the basics, but actually it's the places that I've picked because it's where you get the best return for your investment of time in my opinion. But based on my own practice as a speaker, but also from the hundreds of people that I've coached, who work with startups, who work with tech companies, who are in education, who are scientists, who are academics, who work with charities. When they come to me for one-to-one -one coaching, or sometimes with a company, like when it's automatic, the parent company for WordPress, they're in a group. Based on all their experiences, these are the places where I really see people getting an investment on the time they put in. Yeah. and it's always worth revisiting. So even if you're super experienced or you're just starting out, it doesn't matter. So the things we're going to be talking about, we're going to deal with confidence straight up. Sounds like lots of you are confident because you're already speaking. Awesome. But what does it actually mean to think about confidence as a speaker and what does that look like in different settings? In terms of the things that people come to me with, usually there's two areas that they really need to look at to improve. One of them is how they're dealing with adrenaline. So that can be because they're nervous as a speaker, but it can just be that actually they're super adrenalized because they're on a really packed schedule. Their brain is noisy. They have employees. They have investors. There's a lot going on, and actually they're so hyped up on adrenaline that when they come to speak, commonly the things that they report to me is they, they just couldn't think clearly. They felt like things were getting away from them. They couldn't think on the spot when they were asked that question, but as soon as they're in the car going home, they could. And like, what's going on? And it's literally just the, how we deal with the adrenaline. So super useful, whether we're speaking or actually whether it's just because we're in a really high-pressured environment. For example, we might be defending our thesis. We might be trying to pitch to an investor. It doesn't matter. So I'm going to talk about dealing with adrenaline, but in a really short, practical way. Then I'm going to focus on structure. Because that's also the one that my clients, who are really, really busy people, struggle with. Understandably, because when I say situation in the middle, this position of up here speaking, actually I find it really annoying when some of their bosses put them in that position where they're having to go out and pitch or having to present and are saying, it's just talking, just go do it. Well, no, actually it isn't. You know, there, there is a certain response that we can have physiologically from being stood up here when fight and flight kicks in, but also, you know, how do we know how to structure the time? So today's 45 minutes is going to be more of a workshop than a talk. But you might be giving a five minute pitch, you might be doing a 15 minute presentation, you might be doing a 25 minute keynote, you might be doing a 10 minute TED talk. You know, for each of those, there is an art that goes into how we structure it. It's not that there's one right way, but if we don't actually even have any tools to think about that, what happens is people will come to me and their process is opening up a Word document or a note on their phone and just type it, typing loads of information, and then they have to try and figure out how to jiggle it into eight minutes. Or they'll pull up PowerPoint and start dragging in slides, and then be like, oh my god, I've got 30 slides, like what do I do, how do I organise this? So if, I'm going to go through some different processes so that you don't end up with presentations that are packed just with information, because that can be quite boring to us as humans. It can be okay for a while, but there's much more impactful ways of getting an audience engaged and going about it. Then we're really going to focus on questions. So I would love you to please not feel like you have to sit on questions. If you have questions as we go along, do ask. And also the last section of the workshop would just be completely open to any questions. No question too small, too stupid, too big, doesn't matter. Fire it at me, and if I can help, then I will. So, in terms of adrenaline, and thinking about speaking, the three things that I'm going to suggest are not just because they help when we hit with adrenaline, but because they also help as speakers. 
So the first one, you probably know this, is to be thinking about your breathing. Really simple, but actually, how do we do it? And actually, I think a lot of times it's really mistaught. People will say, like, take a big breath. And people go, and actually, that's the exact opposite of what you need, because it's right up here, and your shoulders are raising, you're already putting tension into the body, and adrenaline's already doing that for you. Adrenaline shortens the muscles in our neck, it tightens the muscles in our backs and shoulders, like tightens our calves and our hips. Awesome if we're then going to go sprint, but actually if we're just going to be stood here trying to be relaxed and to breathe, it's the opposite of what we need. So what we need to do is trigger a better breathing system that's deeper, that's slower, but without being too in our heads that we start to just freak ourselves out. The easiest way to do it is to exhale or breathe out really fully. You can't go wrong, like you're blowing up a balloon. So we're going to try it now. You're literally going to breathe out until it feels like there's no more breath left in your body and that will then trigger a lovely natural breath back in. If at any point thinking about breathing too much breathes you out, just shake your hands, look up, look down, look at your notepad, it's fine. Your body will just know what to do again. But let's try it together. So we're going to breathe out. And in your own time, take a lovely breath back in. You can't do it wrong, doesn't matter if it's through your nose, through your mouth, you don't have to do it at the same time as me, it's not like a competition to see who can do it the longest, you just want to get rid of all the air that's in your lungs, and that will trigger. And as I was looking around, I could see your belly's going, which is brilliant. So without having to get into thinking about, like, where's my diaphragm, how do I do it, it will naturally trigger that. Do that one, two, three times while you're in the car, before you stand up and talk, Anytime you're feeling scattered, before you zoom, jump on a Zoom call or a Skype call with an investor or someone you have to pitch to, one of the best things that you can do to kind of reset your system, signal that actually everything's good, and de-escalate. And then you can speak much more freely. Second one, think about relaxing your jaw. You can do any part of the body, but what's important is that actually you get used to really quickly triggering a relaxation response. So you can just say, and you don't even have to say it out loud, you can just say in your head to yourself, in just a really calm, reassuring way, relax your jaw. You can say, relax your shoulders back and down. You can say, relax your hands. That's a big one for me. If I'm really concentrating, and I know I'm going to be getting on an important call, I tend to make fists, just because I'm like thinking. Actually, relax your hands. And relax your feet. Just giving yourself that cue. One, it helps physically to de-escalate the adrenaline, but also importantly, if your brain is spinning out and overthinking, which lots of my startup people are in the position of doing, they're having to, because they're thinking of so many things at the same time, that doesn't help when you're going to give a talk or pitch an idea. You actually need to be able to clear your mind. So rather than be like, don't think that, don't think that, don't think that, trying to track thoughts out, telling your body and you know what not to do, give it something to do. Give it something really simple that it can do, like relax your jaw, relax your hands, relax your feet, de-escalates things, makes you feel much calmer, and also means that then you're focused, you're clearing out the clutter, and you can think straight. Last one, really thinking about grounding yourself, and these are the last of the physical tips. Really, really simple, and why it's good is you can do it stood up, you can do it sat down exactly as you are now. So again, if I'm getting myself wound up when I'm about to go into a meeting, or a conference call, or I'm going to be teaching online, or standing up here, whatever it is, just taking a moment to settle ourselves, but to actually do it physically. Again, so many of the really super smart people that I work with are so in their heads because they're thinking, they're inventing, they're problem solving. I absolutely get it. But then we completely neglect our body and actually just taking that moment to be like, okay, which way you know, is my weight going? Thinking about your weight going down, your head is the heaviest part of you. Thinking about that weight actually going down your spine it's spreading out through your shoulders, continuing down through your spine, going out through your hips, going down through your sit bones, into the chair where you're sat. Well, for me, it's continuing on down through my legs, out through my feet. Just thinking of that, one, it kind of helps our posture. Not that I'm saying that we then have to all sit in a certain way, but it kind of puts us back into our body. And secondly, if we're going to be speaking, it helps. Because I get clients to take themselves, doing their pictures, and send them to me. Things I commonly see is that they will be doing things like this. They'll be doing things like this. They'll be kind of all over. And it's not that we can't move as speakers, we can. It's not that we have to stand like this. That would be unnatural. <coughs> time. But actually, if we don't ground ourselves, all that extra energy just leaks out. No problem to have energy. It's no problem for me to move over here and talk to you over here. It's not a problem. It is a problem if I'm pacing because I can't control my own energy. Or if actually, like, my energy is leaking out through really distracting mannerisms and I keep, like, messing with my hair. 
Again, it's not we have to turn into like weird freak robots, but just knowing that actually if we can get our energy grounded, then we can move purposefully, we can use the clicker, we can talk to people, it's all good. We can just relax. So those are the three things that I think it's really worth working on if you are a busy entrepreneur and someone who wants to speak to kind of help things flow as they need to. But none of that matters if you actually get up here or you get on a call or you get into a pitch and you haven't got your information structured. So I'm going to go through some really key structures, not because they're the only ones, but because they're a place to start and they help kind of build a vocabulary that you can then use. So the place I'm going to start is title. How many of you come up with titles for your talks? When you give talks? Yeah, quite a lot. Great. And do you have a process for doing that? Or do you just kind of jot things down in a pad? Like, how do you think about it? What do you do, for example? Write a title at the start, then do the talk, and then go back and change the title at the end. OK. <laughs> yeah, OK. So there's no right or wrong that could do it. And how do you come up with that first title? Does it just like pop into your head, or do you have a process? It's the essence of what I'm trying to say. So Perfect. before I've got too granular about it, just like... Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. So I love it. That's a great way of putting it, about it being like the essence of what you're going to say. So when I work with clients to come up with titles, some of them are, well, I say a lot of them, are perfectionists. It often goes with real like type A high performance and they want to come up with the perfect title. I totally get that. It's important, but it's great to have the flexibility that you have to be able to change it. So the exercise I actually do with them is to come up with 10. So they get used to doing it quickly so they can see where their thinking is, pick one and go with it, and know we can always change it and adapt it. So today as we go through, um, I'm, I'm going to ask you to either be thinking of some in your head or on paper, give you a quick heads up just in case you need to have a little fish around in your bag, get some out. We're going to be coming up with some titles, I'm going to show you some different ways of doing it. Why is it worth doing? One, because it's a really good focusing tool to get our thinking going. Two, because it's good to come back to you to see, is this the essence of our talk and be constantly checking against it. And three, if actually you're going to be pitching to conferences, one of the first things they often want is your title and a short description. If you're an academic, it would be called an abstract. So really worth getting confident with knowing you can generate titles in three minutes. You can generate titles in five minutes. When I do it with clients, it doesn't take long at all. So how can you think about that? One way to think about a title is as being a statement or a question. Does it have to be? No. Lots of other ways of coming up with titles, but there's one route in. Strong statement that you can really stand behind, or a really clear question that your talk is going to engage with. Ways of kind of getting into that is thinking, okay, if you put these words at the beginning, if you start with what, or how, or why, or three, linked to your expertise, what would your brain do? So if I apply what to public speaking, it could take me in so many different directions in just a few seconds. It might be what public speaking might look like in 30 years' time. That would take me into the future and into AI and holograms and projections. If I did what public speaking has taught me about humans, that would be a completely different talk. I'd be interested in both, but they're different talks. I'll go down the list. How? And again, you don't always have to put your expertise straight after. <coughs> it could be something like how travelling in China changed my approach to public speaking. Or why. Why public speaking is one of the top three skills that employees are looking for. Or three. There's three things that public speaking has. So what I'd love you to do right now is to think about your area of expertise or something that you're interested in. It doesn't have to be work-related. It's whatever's going to get you moving today. Just have a little play with some of those. I'm going to give you about two or three minutes to come up with it. Statement to question. If your brain gives you something that has nothing to do with that, no problem. My title for today was You Up Here Next Year. It's a proposition. It was none of those, so it's no right or wrong. But just two or three minutes, see what your brain gives you, starting with some of those for just your title. No problem. Okay, no problem. If anyone needs paper or pens, I have both and can help you out. So just wave in my direction. Yes, you do. So you're just coming up with a title, but you're using these words to prompt you if you get stuck. So it might be like what, and then put your expertise in. Uh, actually, that would be that. Use some blank instead. A title for your talk. 
paper? Anyone else need some paper? So immediately I'm coming to that talk yeah. because I'm like, yeah, it's too hard, it takes too long, I want to know the solution, love it. What did you come up with over here? Um, what makes a good brand? Ooh. Because I focus a lot on the brand yeah. stuff, so yeah. what, what actually makes a brand a good brand? Right, because again, I think all well, this is going to be practical and then get some insights, love it. Anyone else? What did we come up with over here? Okay. Uh, something like, how nature is shaping today's technology? Ooh. Interesting, because again, I wouldn't think of nature and technology being in the same title, how nature is shaping technology. So again, you've piqued my curiosity there. Great. Uh, how is this technology can create competitive advantage. Oh, again, like I, I love a how-to talk, because again, I'm like, mm, this is going to give me some information I can take away. Fantastic. Great. So, and you did that super quickly. So again, this would be one stage idea of like, let's just buzz through some titles, sit with them, start working, and as you uh, so cleverly said, you can always change it as long as you haven't submitted it to the conference. And even then, sometimes organizers will let you change. So, <coughs> next up, how are we gonna start? How are we gonna start this book? Anyone got any ideas? How could we start? Yes? I think it's a good to start uh, with a question. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one perfect solution. Start with a question, love it, you get them engaged, awesome. What else could we do? Yes? A hook or Ooh. a really interesting fact that yes. gets people alert and awake and Perfect. focused. Perfect. Love it. I love thinking of it as a hook, because that could be, and then you've also given us an example of that, an interesting fact. But that is exactly what the purpose of the start is, is that drawing the audience in. Like, why is it worth their time to even be here? So, love <coughs> that. Any other suggestions? <coughs> Do you have one? Uh, I was going to say, by introducing the theme. Yes. That Great. you could then think potentially reference back to later yeah. or even bookend the thing. Great. Great, I love it. Oh, and you are really on it. Sorry, I've no, no. your end one already. Oh, okay, you would expect that. <laughs> that's okay. I don't mind you using your uh, brain to solve it. That's good. But exactly, you're thinking about how to bookend, so you're thinking about introducing the theme, and we're going to come on to the end very soon. All great suggestions. You can start with a strong statement. Okay, so you've already been thinking about that linked to your title. You can start with a question, which you've already got. You can start with a statistic, like you said, or an interesting fact. You can start with an image, particularly if you're going to be in a venue where there is a lovely big projector and that's going to be really gripping. You can start with a story. Okay, so even people that are very much in the startup world, there's a lot of interest in storytelling. And I don't mean in the way that it has to be like a huge, big arcing story like climbing Mount Everest. It is still that human perspective related to design or related to coding. So it can be starting with a story to draw people in. Not just that, it could be a quote. It could be a song, who knows? But it's, again, thinking actively about what that beginning is. And again, I do that in just a few minutes with clients, so we're like, what could it be? If I don't, and I had examples of this on Sunday with all my speakers for the conference, if they just start telling me about their talk, their brain is going in 50 directions. And that can be fine, we can do a brainstorming around that, but actually, if I'm like, what, what question would it be? What interesting fact would it be? What image would it be? They know. They know those key moments and it helps them start filter, even if they're then going to change it. So as you said, what do we think about next? I do get my clients to think about the end. Why? It's often one of the weakest <coughs> parts in talks. If we don't think about it, what happens is we kind of go, oh, that's all I have, and it just sort of can trail off. It's really good to think about the end. Also, it gives you the chance to do what you're saying, which is then you can think about how the theme arcs. Like, where are we actually going? Like, what is this journey we're taking them on? Where do we want them to even be by the end? So what could an end look like? So it could, again, be some of the exact things from the beginning. Any other thoughts? How else could we end? Call to action. Love it. Call to action. Brilliant. So getting us to actually do something. Awesome. And you did that um, for us in the workshop, didn't you? So that was great. Love that. Call to action. Did Summarising you? the whole... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Providing a useful summary. And again, you can do that in a really short way just to recap. Because again, speakers, including myself, often overestimate how much people can take in. Particularly if they're in a conference setting where they may have had eight talks in that day, things start to get really blurry. It's actually really good for how we learn in our brain to have that recap if it's done in a really short, impactful way. Awesome. So it could be pulling out 
an insight. It could be zooming out. So maybe you've introduced us to how you're using the technology, but you zoom out and show us 10 years into the future, or you give us a global perspective. It could be that you challenge us, you get us to do something really practical. It could be that you circle back, exactly as you're saying, to that theme that you've introduced. It could be that call to action. But also it could be a quote. You know, it could be, again, a beautiful image. It could be a video clip. So these are not exhaustive, but even just thinking about what that would be, and I will brainstorm it really early on with my clients, so we've kind of got those good points. <coughs> no problem to shift, but at least now we're thinking about the arc of our talk. We're not just in like a big soup of information. What next? So I'm actually going to pause there so you can have a little think about the title that you wrote down. How might you start? How might you end? I'm not going to get you to uh, be on the spot and deliver it at all. So if anyone's brain's freaking out, you can just relax. Just brainstorming. How might you start this talk? How might you end it? Challenge yourself to come up with some different ways. And we'll give you again about three minutes to do so. Absolutely no problem to come back to these and work on them. But again, you've shown yourself what you can do in just a couple of minutes. You've got some titles, you've got some possible starts, some possible ends. And then the last piece is thinking about like how many pieces you want in the middle. So I'm going to come on to some other structures that are much more diverse in case your brain is like, no, I just don't think like this, it's too boxy, that's fine. But a lot of the clients that I work with, they, they really have a short amount of time to make their talks and I need to make sure that there's not too much information. So a quote from Chris Anderson, who's the head of TED, is that overstuffed equals underexplained. And it's one of the biggest things I have with my speakers, is they are so knowledgeable, they have so much knowledge to share, so many skills, so many experiences, and they're trying to ram it all in. But actually, that doesn't leave any breathing space, quite literally, and doesn't leave time for the audience to digest. So just thinking about what those three things are. <coughs> so then you can go back and you can think about the time for your talk. And again, some of you may already do this. Lots of my clients don't. So... There's absolutely no reason why you have to script out your whole talk and deliver it to know how long it's going to take. Some of them do do that for the shorter you know, TED Talks, for example, but actually it's really useful to allocate the time so that you're giving the most value to the audience and so you don't end up in that position where you're running out and then cramming the end. And also, really usefully, it then means that you can practice it a little bit. So you can just work on the first five minutes, you can just work on the last five minutes. You don't think, oh my God, I need two hours to work on my talk. Fine if you can do that. Lots of the clients I've got, they can't. So we're like, that's fine. Your goal is just to work on that first section. Ten minutes of content, we're just going to do that. You're just going to show you that. So that's how I broke down this talk, very roughly. No right answer, but it just gives us a way of thinking about it. So I literally came up with my title, proposition. I started with a question. We don't know what the end is going to be yet. I talked about confidence, adrenaline. I talked about a modular structure, which is what this is, is when you break it down into pieces, that's literally all it is. And then we're gonna come on to our final section before we go into the Q&A. And I've just explained why. So we can break it down, we can be efficient, we can rehearse it, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. So some other modular ones that you can think about, these are really common ones, these are not things I've invented, is thinking about problem, cause, solution. It's a really common one when people are pitching products. And if you think about the time for that, I'll show you the chart later, you, it, you again do not have to think about each of these as being equal parts. It might be a small amount on the problem, a small amount on the cause, a huge amount on the solution. It might actually be problem failure solution. You know, if you're at a tech conference and you're sharing your experiences, it's actually really useful to kind of see behind the curtain, to see that human who's designing those products and we can learn a lot from each other's failures as well as from successes. You know, what, what didn't go well and how did you overcome it? Challenge, choice, outcome, another one. The reason that I think this one's really good is that if you are interested in storytelling, you can take this as a little micro version of storytelling. When you're thinking about telling a story, what was the challenge that you're facing? What was the choice you made? That's where we put yourself in the other position and go, would I have made the same choice? And what was the outcome? It gives it that little bit of human drama in a really simple way. Many, many more ways you can approach this. This is just a few, not to overwhelm you, but so that you can see, oh, okay, that looks doable. I could work on a problem section for a few minutes. I could work on a choice. I could work on a solution. And so that chart is literally to show you they don't have to be equal. 
Um, when I work with startups, you know, they're going to spend a lot more time on the solution. That's what their product's providing or their service. So I say that's where we are within our flow. We've gone through confidence, we've gone through modular, and now I'm going to show you some other structures, just in case you are the kind of person who's thinking, that's just not how my brain works. I'm really visual. No problem. So I have a client at the minute who is really, really visual, and he does not think in a linear way at all, and he responds much better to us getting on a Zoom call and brainstorming it all out onto a huge chart. There's information everywhere. That's cool. That's not a problem. There's nothing wrong with how he's approaching it. He's very creative. He has tons of energy. And he just has all these like flourishes. So actually for him, it would be quite difficult to go through that process as I've described it. I've described it for you in that way because so many of my startup people love to go through a really structured process. But he prefers something like this. So we'll fill the paper with loads of pieces. But what's common is that before we've done that, I'm still going to be asking the same questions. And then I'm still going to be like, okay, that's cool. But out of all those dots, like where do we want to start? What's going to be an impactful way to draw the audience in? Okay, that's brilliant, but out of all these things we put on the paper, where do we think we're going to end? Like, what's going to be a really good note to end on? What's going to resonate? And how are we going to get through those dots? We're going to have to leave some of those dots out because there's too many. If we just want to travel through, say, five, which are we going to pick? In what order? And how do you make sense of it in your brain so you know what the transitions are so you can take the audience with you on that awesome ride? Because if you know, you understand the logic, you can take them with you. If you don't, we end up getting this hopping where we're thinking like, what? How? Like, why? Like, we need to understand the journey through. So I think if it's connect the dots or a constellation, or sometimes, I'll, you know, for someone who's very visual, we'll talk about it like a road trip. Like, where are we headed? Where are we starting? Why are you showing me these sites along the way? Why are you showing me these images? Why are you telling me that thing? So they get super clear. Also, lists can be really also if you just like I've only got 10 minutes to work on this talk that I need to go and deliver at least if you're thinking about a list you're filtering for relevance you're thinking of the top most useful things that you could share or the three things that have saved you the most time in this or like when it's shopping you know for example at least you're not telling me everything about shopping and how you set up your company and why you should care like no if you only think about three things it's these so lists can be super useful underrated so fast this one I call the portal, because also work with people who are really visual. They're like designers and filmmakers, and actually they want to show their work. They want to show the images. They want to show the video clips. That's awesome. Or I work with lots of scientists who, again, want to take me into their world, which is brilliant. But again, the common point, you still need to think about how you're going to get me into this new world. Show me this expanse and how it works and completely blow my mind. And then how are you going to take me out again? Like, what insight am I going to leave with? So we'll work on a structure like that. Okay, this is just to show you some of the possible ways. And how I'm going to think about ending with you is I would love you to think about what you've put on the paper right now and turn that into action for yourself. Because you don't need to wait a year. I've only mentioned this as a common reference point because we're all in the same room. You can all picture you up here next year. But actually, in your busy lives, you've probably got talks that you could be giving next week, next month. I was like, maybe. <laughs> so what I'd love you to do is look back at your paper for a moment and have a think about the title that you've done, the start, the end. Can you capture what those three pieces of information that went down the middle might be? What would be those like, top three things, three areas of investigation? Capture it for yourself now while it's still fresh in your mind. And then as you're doing so, I'd love you to make a commitment to yourself. What's one thing you're going to do today? So it doesn't have to be a big thing, like pitching to a conference, but what's one thing that we've covered that you could do? Could you think about your breathing when you get in the car? Could you think about grounding yourself when you sit down after lunch? Could you think about relaxing your shoulders back and down, particularly if you work on laptops a lot like I do? Could you think about relaxing your shoulders back and down? Could you try out your title on other people who are here? What's one thing you could do today? Moving on from that, what's one thing this week? So by Sunday, what's one thing that you could do to improve as a speaker, to advance yourself as a speaker? It would help you, would help your business. Who could you contact? What could you research? What could you scope out? And again, sometimes we think that these have to be really time-consuming things, and they don't. They could literally be taking what you've got on your paper and talking it through with a friend, saying, I'm working on a new talk, haven't got it nailed yet, what do you think about this? 
see what questions they have. Take five minutes. And one thing this month, so we're only at the start of September, by the end of September, what's one thing you'd really like to commit to as a speaker that you know would move you forward? Would it be applying to speak in another country? <coughs> would it be getting your talk videos? Would it be emailing conference organisers? Would it be going to a conference, sussing it out? Because the one thing I encourage all speakers uh, who work with me to do is to constantly be setting themselves a challenge, but that actually integrates really well into their lives. Sometimes we think of public speaking as being like this thing that we only do when we show up at Summit now. Actually, no. There's so many opportunities now when we're on calls with people, when we're pitching an idea, when we're just in a meeting, where actually the process of planning something and thinking clearly about what it is and how we might communicate it, how we might get people's attention, how we might keep people's attention is so useful. The speakers that I work with, they don't just get the benefits when they're giving their keynote. They're like, wow, people are actually listening to me in meetings. Well, actually someone returned you know, my phone call. Actually someone watched the video blog that I made. So it's super worth putting time into any of these activities. Great that you've engaged so well today. Thank you. And you've got this action list. Now I'm going to hand over to you for any questions. Is there anything that I haven't answered and that you would love to know? Yes, go for it. I think you may have answered it then, but I, I guess these rules kind of apply to vlogging and building mm -hmm. a personal brand is becoming quite a big sort of topic. And I yeah. think with the internet and you know social media, you know you can talk globally. You're not you're you not can. restricted to Bristol and Bath. You know you can totally. actually talk to the whole world. And 100%. these skills can really sort of um, carry you into that space, can't they? Exactly, and a lot of the companies that I work with, they're recognising that now, and they're actually asking for workshops that are specifically on remote speaking. So for example, I'm working with Automatic and their development team, and what they want one of their workshops on is how is a speaker to be literally sat behind your laptop, but connecting with conferences virtually, because more people are taking virtual submissions. So yeah, absolutely. Yes? So do you recommend just staying in the one place and riding yourself, mm. and not walking around? Yeah. I think it really depends on, and, and as, the quick answer is no. The longer answer is it depends on the situation. I think it's really good to be able to practice both. I think when you're running a workshop or something like this, it's actually lovely to be able to move because you can engage other people. The reason it can be really good to practice grounding is there are some situations where you're like this, and you probably know this, and the mic is here, and they haven't actually got a clip-on mic so you can move, so you are locked to this lectern now because of how the AV's been done. So it's really good to not, because I actually don't like it, I prefer to move. It's just good to be able to practice that. It's also good to practice it for when they're videoing, because I ask the organisers, is it okay actually if I just run this like a workshop? Because if it was full video, I'd have to be much more mindful about where I'm positioning myself so that they can see this. So that actually I've got the mic, so it's being recorded, so that's where the camera is, and I'd be aware of both, but I'd be able to move a lot less. So that's why when, you know, the red, if you watch TED Talks, they have the red dot. How is, yes, it's partly branding, but it's also because that's how the cameras are set up. So many conferences are recorded now, and the speakers, when I work with them, they actually can't move off the, off the, you know, the red dot, wow. because otherwise they're literally out of frame. So I work with them on branding so that they feel good being able to do that. But actually, you know, if you're at a tech conference and it doesn't matter, and the video is not a primary thing, no problem to be like bounding across the stage and using your energy, providing it's not distracting. Yeah. Um. Structurally, how yes. do you go about tackling a talk? Say you're doing a five minute talk, yeah. and a week after you've got a half an hour talk. Yes. Is it a case of just taking each of the, the parts of your talk and yeah. expanding them all? Or mm. would you personally tackle a half an hour talk in a different way to a short? Yeah, so the ideal answer, I would love to just tackle it as completely separate. I'm always like, what's the audience? and how long have I got, and I will think of it as though I'd never given the talk before and start with a blank page. Obviously I will then practically then pull in slides, but the reality of it is the kind of people that I work with, often they're like, I don't want to do that. I don't have time, I've got this half an hour. What's the best way of condensing it down? The reason that I say I think of it as a completely separate talk is sometimes I actually think it takes longer to edit and take things out than it does to start fresh and just be like, do you know what? Realistically in five minutes, this is the arc. This is where I'm going to start, this is where I'm going to finish, and I'm, you know, it may be that you are maybe putting in point one, but I do think of it as a new thing. So, for example, I gave an Ignite talk, which is five minutes, and that was completely different, such a different experience than that half hour. So, ideally, think of it fresh. If you can't, then, as you say, no problem to think of it as really just being one point or three quick ones, as long as it's enough uh, depth that people get something from it.
Yes. Question on perspectives, yes, right. if you want, when, you, when we're sort of getting uh, the, the message through of a complicated uh, yeah. uh, problem or uh, sure. statement, uh, like pausing or uh, what kind of story, what yeah. would be you know, your recommendations on that? So you've given two great ones. So the question, I'm repeating just in case um, you can't always hear when bodies are facing different ways, was recommendations for when it's a really complex subject. And you came up with two great ones yourself, pausing, hugely important, massively underused by speakers. The audience needs it just as much as we do. We need it to breathe, they need it cognitively to be able to take something in. You also mentioned story. Great, because the brain, our brains are hardwired to remember the structure of story more than you know, an unsequenced flow of information. Other things that really help is really knowing your audience as best you can. You know, the amount of data that you have, what level are you talking at? Are you talking to peers? Or are you, as a lot of the TED speakers are, actually talking to a, you know, an intelligent, interested audience, but who don't work in AI, for example? In that kind of case, it's really looking at things like analogies, which is when you, when you kind of think, okay, an analogy for it is like the one people use a lot, is that it's like a house. And then they'll describe how that's like making the floors, that's the walls. That gets overused to the point of being a cliche, but actually finding an analogy that works. Using stories, using examples. If you don't feel confident, like, you think, oh, I'm not a storyteller. Everyone I've ever worked with has been great at giving examples. They say, like, can you tell me a time when that happened? You know, what did it look like? Who was involved? What were you doing? How did it work out? Just give me an example. Everyone is great at giving examples. So think of it as giving like relevant examples. Other things is like, thinking about the visuals. Is there any way, you probably know this, like, that you can make it clearer through a visual if that's an option. And then making sure that the streams aren't competing. Because again, some of my speakers who are trying to explain really complex things. So for example, I was working with a speaker at Google who works at DeepMind. And his talk was amazing, but his language was so dense and so packed with fascinating stuff. And he had slides that were animated and really complicated. And those two tracks for people that work in, uh, don't work in that field were too much. So it's like, no, the animations are really cool, but that needs to happen at a time when there's a pause. And it needs to come in so I can even follow the trajectory of where it's going. And then we come back to you and we hear from you because you're overloading my brain. I can't keep up. And that's really important in public speaking because, again, if you think in writing, you can always like, jump back a paragraph and read it again. If I'm speaking and you lose what I'm saying, it's really tricky. Hence why pause is great to pull, pull people back in. Things like signposting, which is when actually you do like a little recap or you refer back to something you've said, you paraphrase it, you re-explain it in a different way. It's not that you're dumbing down, you're just cognitively giving the audience a chance to go, oh yeah, that's how that, that links to that. That's why that matters. Oh yeah, that's why. Like actually being more over than we think we need to be. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Yes. My favourite quote is yes. T. S. Eliot said, "If I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter." Yes. So I, it's always the case trying to distill the thing down to the number, even for mm. like a thirty-minute presentation, takes an awful lot of time. Yeah. Right? And people are busy and all the rest. But yeah. You got any tips for? Not so much you're not going to streamline the process completely, but for you know helping you sort of zoom in on those things and, mm. and make that bit good. That's yes, it's a really good um, point. So he's asking again about how to really streamline it, and again that thing that actually takes a lot of time to make something short. So that's partly why I've broken it down in a modular way so you can attack it during the week. <laughs> But also, I really test my speakers to be able to tell me what their talk is really about in the shortest amount of time. And to distill, and to distill, and to distill. And I think that's part of the reason why TED's had so much success. It's because it's an idea worth spreading, it's their tagline. It's not six ideas, it's one idea. And even when amazing people pitch and come to me with their TEDx talks and we work on them, it still takes so many drafts to get to that one idea. Because I know it's still three but actually just that one, that you have the confidence to be able to communicate, but you bring it to life through a story, and you bring it to life through a quote, and you bring it to life through a practical example, and you bring it to life through data. And at the end of it, can I say, oh yeah, I saw his talk, it's really cool. It was about how AI does, and actually an audience member being able to repeat it back, even if you feel like it misses all the nuance, is amazing. If you try it out on people, and you say, what was it about, and they're like, well you said this, and, and they're giving you a disconnected way, it means that actually it's just too much. So that's the other thing that I would say, is, um, and I didn't mention this, is rehearsing, testing out, rehearsing, testing out. And what did you get from that? What confused you? What can you remember? What do you want to know more about? What was boring? All of that could be really good. 
Great, I think we're at time now. We are, just about the time. But I'm going to be staying behind with them for a few more minutes. So if anyone's got any questions or you'd rather ask them one to one, you're super welcome to. If not, I wish you the very best. Is anyone else speaking today? Anyone else speaking tomorrow? Yeah, that's great. Anyone else speaking here next year? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. I like your attitude. <laughs> yes, great. Well done.